Let's open our Bibles, if you will, to Exodus chapter 17 this morning. Exodus chapter 17. I really just want to be an encouragement to you. Uh, maybe breathe a little life into you this morning. I know Job, and when Job was going back and forth with his friends, he said, if I were in your stead, I would strengthen you with my words. And I would like to strengthen you some, hopefully, with some words from the Scriptures. And pray that God will minister to you as we look at this passage of Scripture. Exodus chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17 will begin in verse 8. Exodus 17 and verse 8. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy and they took a stone and put it under him and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven." And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nissi. For he said, Because the Lord hath sworn that he will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Amen. Pastor Kim, will you pray and ask the Lord to bless the message, please? Father, we thank you for telling that they come through Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 And convict their heart and they can repent and turn to Jesus as a Savior. Father, thank you for everything and your grace to mothers. Thank you, Pastor Walker. And as he preach, please, please fill with the Holy Spirit. Amen. As he preach, he can convict our heart, change our life. Father, I pray we can serve you better. We can be better Christians. Amen. I think our campers will probably know what I'm going to preach on this morning because I've been preaching on it all week. And I preached all week on being a pattern and following a pattern that God's given us. Now, in the Bible, we know that Paul the Apostle told Timothy in 1 Timothy 1, he said, I am a pattern for those that hereafter should believe. We know dispensationally we follow the Apostle Paul. He is the Apostle to the Gentiles. But we know on a very practical note, God gives us patterns throughout our lives. And we thank God, first of all, for the divine pattern of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is that divine pattern. The Bible said Jesus did no sin, neither was guile found in His mouth. Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. The perfect pattern. But God also gives us the Scriptures. And God also gives us men and women, just like He did the Apostle Paul to Timothy. He gives us men and women like you in this church to be a pattern and to be a testimony to these young people. I think as I stand up here and say what a blessing these young people were this week, I think we can attribute that, first of all, to the Lord. Amen? Amen. We give credit and glory to God. But second of all to your faithfulness as godly parents, to this church as being an example for the younger generation. Here in the text, the Bible says that the Lord uh, or Moses built an altar and called it, verse number 17, Jehovah Nissi or Nissi. That means Jehovah my banner. We sang that song, Hold the Fort, and it said, Wave the answer back to heaven. It's like we have a banner and we have Jehovah is my banner. We have a pattern to look to. And I believe Bible Baptist Church International 
is a pattern in this community, is a pattern in the Korean community, is a pattern in the Bible-believing community. You have done some things, not just through your pastor, but by God's grace to be a pattern and be an example for this next generation. It's a big deal. It's a big deal that you stay in the fight. It is a big deal. It matters that you keep your hands up. It matters. There's a great reward in watching these young people and see the next generation and, and some that weren't saved getting saved. We saw Daniel get saved this week at camp. Amen. That was a blessing. And hopefully if there's someone here that's not saved, you need to get saved before it's too late. You trust Jesus as your Savior before it's too late. It's a blessing to see the rewards of faithfulness. But you know, with those rewards, there's great responsibility. There's great responsibility to keep your hands up. I want to encourage you this morning, keep your hands up. Notice here in the text that Moses is the pattern. Y'all know in the Bible that you have Moses, and then after Moses is Joshua. And when Moses gets ready to die, God told Moses, put your hands on Joshua. And God passed the mantle from Moses to Joshua. Joshua had served and ministered to Moses all those years. Moses was a pattern and a testimony for young Joshua. We know that David passed on the throne and the kingdom to Solomon. And he was a pattern and a testimony for Solomon. God did not let David build the temple. But he let David have the pattern for the temple. And then Solomon built that temple. We also know in the Bible, Elijah put his mantle on Elisha. Remember that? For 13 or 15 years, Elisha poured water on the hands of Elijah. And he served and he watched and he trained under Elijah. And one day, Elijah left and it was Elisha with a double portion of the spirit and power of Elijah. Paul, as I mentioned earlier, passed on the ministry to young Timothy. And I believe here we're watching one generation of Bible believers pass on something to another generation. It's good to see Pastor Shribe over here, 80 something years young, still in church, still faithful. The other Pastor Shribe mentioned he's coming up on his 50th spiritual birthday. What a blessing for 50 years, still in church, still reading the Bible. Still witnessing to people. That's a blessing. That's not something to take lightly. To watch one generation pass on, not just doctrine in your head, but practical Christianity from your heart. Hey, young generation, this is how you do it. You serve God. Day in, day out. Week in, week out. Month in, month out. Year in, year out. Decade after decade. Keep your hands up. Moses is that pattern. You know, we're not saying that the younger generation is to be lazy and just sit back and watch the older generation. We're not talking about being lazy and just watching a pattern. There was a man one time, he's driving down the road and he sees a car that's broken down on the side of the highway and there's a lady standing out beside the car with a flat tire. He pulls over and begins to help her with the tire and he gets out and he changes the tire and he jacks the car up and takes the old tire off and puts the spare tire on the car. And as he's letting the car back down, the lady says, oh, please be very careful and don't wake up my husband in the back seat. <laughs> We're not condoning laziness. We know the younger generation has got to plow their own rows. We know the younger generation has got to grow in their own faith with God, but you still have to be a pattern. You still have to be a testimony. You've got to keep your hands up. They are watching you. They're learning more by what they see than by what they hear. They may hear you say one thing, but they're watching you do another thing. It matters that your testimony and your profession matches what you do. Keep your hands up. 
Many younger generation believers quit because of the older generation quits. I've had people tell me before, I'm not in church anymore because so-and-so left church. A preacher ran off with a secretary. Or so-and-so did this, so I got out of church. Now that doesn't justify what they did. The Bible says in Romans 12, So then every one of us shall give account of himself with God. You are going to give account of your sins to God. You're not going to give account for everybody else. You can't use everybody else for an excuse. Oh, my daddy dropped me on my head when I was a baby. <laughs> you can't always use that for an excuse. You're going to give account to God. But, however, older generation, you have a responsibility. Keep your hands up. Those little eyes are watching you. They're watching how you respond through the trials. They're watching how you respond through the tribulation. They're watching how you respond when you're tempted. Keep your hands up. I think sometimes we don't realize the pattern that we're setting. I don't think we realize that somebody's watching us. Whether you have children or not, whether you have people that you think are watching you or not, there's somebody watching you. People you may work with. They're not believers. But they're watching how you respond in life. They're looking at you to see if you're going to follow Christ. A friend of mine got married several years back and I was one of his groomsmen. And they have the rehearsal. And then after the rehearsal, they drove to this place to have the rehearsal dinner. And so I jumped in the car and took off to this place and little did I know I had a bunch of people following me. I got lost. I'm going down a back road somewhere, and I, I got lost, and I turned around, and then went down the other way, and then I started noticing all these cars behind me turning around. <laughs> I didn't realize all these people had been following me the entire time. Just like we don't realize a lot of people are watching us. They're watching to see if we're going to let our hands drop. Some of us come in on Sunday and we hear the specials and we hear the songs and we hear the preaching and boy, we hold our hands up high. But by the afternoon, we're already dropping our hands down. We watch the sports event on TV and we get mad and we, they drop a little further. And by Monday morning, our hands are all the way down. Moses is a pattern for keeping our hands up. Now I want you to notice in verse number 9, he says, I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. Notice the mountain is the place for keeping your hands up. The mountain is the place. Moses is the pattern. The mountain is the place. Notice we have a follower first and a leader next. Take your Bible, if you will, and turn back to 1 Thessalonians 1. I'm going to go to a couple of different places this morning. I want you to see this. 1 Thessalonians 1. First Thessalonians chapter 1. Remember, Moses was 80 years old when he began to be a leader. Moses was a follower well before he was a leader. And notice, if you're going to lead, you must follow first. Notice in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, look in verse number 5. 1 Thessalonians 1, 5. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that you are in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come." Notice back in verse number 3, he mentions, first of all, their work of faith. In verse number 9, you see, they turn to God. Those things match. 
If you're going to be saved, you have to have faith. And that faith is not faith in yourself. That faith is in Jesus Christ, and that means you turn to God. That means there has to be repentance. You have to turn from what you're trusting now to trust in Jesus Christ completely. You can't have Buddha and Jesus, Mohammed and Jesus, religion and Jesus. It must be Jesus only. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The work of faith is turning to Jesus Christ. Turn to God from idols, and then it says to serve the living God. Notice in verse number 3, he says, your labor of love. Notice their love motivated them to work, to serve the living God. And then notice he says in verse number 10, to wait for his Son from heaven. And he mentions in verse number five, 3, the patience of hope. Our hope is the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just in salvation, but the Lord Jesus Christ coming back. We're waiting for Him. Well, as I was studying this passage, I began to notice that three, that, that breakdown, and I began to apply it to the whole book of Thessalonians. You'll notice that in chapter 2, it's dealing with them turning in faith from idols to serve God. In chapter 3, is dealing with their service through persecution. In chapter 4, it talks about waiting for Jesus Christ to come. And then in chapter 5, it would be watching for that deliverance from the wrath to come. You know, we've been saved from the penalty of sin. Amen? I was regenerated. I was born again. That means when I trusted Christ, I was saved from the penalty of sin. But I'm also saved from the power of sin. Day by day, I have to be renewed in the spirit of my mind if I'm going to follow that pattern. And if I'm going to be saved from the power of sin on my life. And then, thank God, we're going to be saved from the presence of sin at the rapture. I'll never see sin again. I'll never see suffering again. I'll never see sorrow again. I'll never see separation from loved ones again. The rapture will answer all of our problems. So we have a cycle here in 1 Thessalonians, I believe, should repeat itself. You know, in the book of Judges, do you remember reading in the book of Judges the sinner's cycle? You read about what took place with Israel. They serve God, and then they get complacent. They have prosperity, so they forget about God. And then they start serving the other idols, and that cycle starts. They start serving other gods and false idols, and they get sold into the hands of their enemies, and they become slaves. And as they become slaves, they are persecuted, and they have a bad life, and they start turning to God. And then when they turn to God and repent, God sends them a judge. And that judge comes in and delivers them. And then they start serving God again and things are great for a little while until they get prosperity again. And then they begin to be complacent again. And then they begin to serve false gods and false idols again. And then they get sold into slavery again. And then they're in bondage again. And then they cry out to God. It's a cycle. A sinner's cycle. Here in Thessalonians, I believe we have the saint cycle. Amen. You turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And then you wait for His Son from heaven. And then you know what you do? you got to turn to God from idols again. Because here's where I want to kind of park a little bit this morning. There is a place for you keeping your hands up. And see, we, I believe a lot of times, we lose sight of the fact that we need revival. We need to constantly seek the Lord Jesus Christ and make sure our hands are up. Because after a while, they naturally start dropping. You don't notice it. Just over time. You think everything's okay, but your hands and your arms are dropping. You still come to church. You still read your Bible. You still pray. But your ritualism has turned into, your ritual has turned into a rut. And your Christianity has turned into church I call it. And your hands are dropping. The mountain's the place for keeping your hands up. There's a means for keeping this up. I want you to notice the means of the power. Go back to Exodus, please. Exodus chapter 17, very, very important. 
You say, preacher, if I need constant renewing, how does this happen? How do we avoid falling into a rut? Because I'm going to tell you this, young people know if it's real, if it's genuine, or if it's fake. They can tell. They can tell if you really love God or if it's just a ritual. They can tell if you're serious or not. Now look over here in Exodus chapter 17, verse number 9. He tells Aaron, he says, I will go on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. Do you remember that rod? All the way back in Exodus chapter number 4, when Moses was on the backside of the desert, and he was leading those sheep, and God appeared to him in the flame of fire in that bush, Moses has his rod. And as God began to call Moses to lead his people, he told Moses, he said, Moses, what's in your hand? He said, a rod? That's the rod of God we're reading about. You see, there's an unseen power with that rod. If you were to look at Moses' rod, it would look just like any other rod. If you walk down the road and I see you, you look just like any other person. Jesus mentioned the new birth and the Holy Spirit in John 3, and He says, The wind bloweth where it listeth, thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whither it cometh or whither it goeth. So is everyone that's born of the Spirit. The Spirit is that unseen power. You can't tell just by looking at someone physically on the outside, but there's an unseen force. There's an unseen power that helps you keep your hands up. If you saw Moses' rod, it was just like anybody else's rod. Why did God choose to use that rod? Remember when He held it across and the Red Sea parted? Remember when He turned the water to blood with that rod? I want to say that this rod has power because, first of all, absolute surrender. When Moses had that rod in Exodus 4... And he saw Moses, and he saw God in the flame of fire. And God called unto Moses. He said, Moses, what's in your hand? He said, a rod. God said, cast it down. Give it up. But, but Lord, I'm a shepherd. I can't be a shepherd anymore without this rod. God said, give it up. Until you surrender absolutely you will not have the power of God in your life. Moses had to throw the rod down. Until you let go, you can never hold on. Moses is holding his hands up, but in his hands he has the rod of God. And now he has an unseen force. He has unseen power to be able to hold on to the very thing he let go. And until you let go, you'll never be able to hold on to God like you're supposed to. Because what you will be doing is holding on to yourself. You'll be holding on to your dreams, your goals, your life. And as we know as Christians, your life is not yours. Your life and my life belong to God. The Bible says our life is hid with Christ in God. What's the secret? What's the means of power? How do you keep your hands up, preacher? First of all, absolute surrender. Look at this. That's the same thing they do when a policeman points a gun at you, right? <laughs> Stick them up. Hold them up. You're under arrest. I surrender. Yeah. Paul said we should lift up holy hands. When we pray, why do we do this? We say, I surrender. We sing that song, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender. Moses is holding up his hands in absolute surrender. You'll never have the victory until you surrender absolutely. Winston Churchill, most of you know him in history, in World War II and different things. He said this, To all of us comes that moment in life when we are literally tapped on the shoulder to do a very special thing, unique to ourselves and our talents. What a pity if that moment finds us unprepared. What a pity if that moment finds us unprepared. You know, you're supposed to be on top of the mountain holding up your hands. 
Some of you are older. Some of you are older Christians. You've been saved many years. It's not your job to be down in the valley with Joshua fighting. You've got a new army coming up. You've got a young army coming up. And they're pretty mean on the paintball field, let me tell you that. If they can be a good Christian like they were on the paintball field, we can get something done for God, amen. But many of you here as church members, God's got you on top of the mountain and it's your job to keep your hands up. Because they're looking up there. They see you up there on that mountain. God's got you on the mountain so everybody down below can look up and see you. Jesus said a city set on a hill cannot be hid. There's a reason the city's on the hill. There's a reason you as an older Christian are in this church. You say, well, preacher, I can't do as much anymore. All I can do is pray. What do you mean all you can do is pray? Prayer is the most important. Some of you, you barely can make it into church. He mentioned for prayer this morning the older lady, the sister, who can't come to church much anymore and she used to be faithful all the time. You know what? She's still important. She still means something to God. Those of you that can't fight down in the valley, you can still hold your hands up. You're on the mountaintop and you hold the rod of God in your hand because they're looking at you. They need you at Bible Believers Baptist Church International. They need the older saints, the older Christians to keep those hands up. They need Pastor Kim and Pastor Shribe and Brother Jay. They need you all to stay in the fight. There's too many people quitting. The average pastor goes to a church for two or three years at the most. Maybe four years and he's done. Not even there long enough to know the people. Thank God for pastors here that are in this for the long haul. The second thing about this rod, absolute surrender. But notice as he holds the rod up, verse number 10, he's holding the rod up, verse 11 And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed, and when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. Verse 12, But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he set their own. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Absolute surrender and then accepting support. You know, sometimes I think it's unfair when you get older. I mean, think about it for just a second. The older you get, the more physical problems you have. Amen? Can I get a witness? Amen. Say amen right there, the old preacher says. I'm over the hill. You know, I'm over 40. (laughs) I tell we have a lot of ladies in our church, some older ladies, and they're, they're over 80. And I say, you're over the hill twice. You went over to one hill, went down over the hill twice, you know, working on your next hill. Like Caleb said, give me the next mountain, you know. Yeah. But, you know, I can't do at 43 what I could do at 33 or what I could do at 23. You know, the older you get, the more burdens you have, the more physical problems you have, and then you have to face a big emotional problem, and that is losing a loved one. Most of the time, now I know sometimes younger people pass away and that's bad and sad. But it's almost unfair. You have physical ailments, physical problems. Maybe you can't remember things as good as you used to. The memory begins to slip. And then you have someone, a soulmate that you've been married to for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years and then they die. That's a hard time. The hardest trials come at the end. The hardest part of the Christian race is at the finish line. It's not how you start the race. It's how you finish the race. And it's the toughest at the end. But we seem to focus all of our attention on the very beginning. If we can just get them in. Let's bring in the new music and get the younger generation. Well, I'm here to tell you, they're just going to blow in, blow up, and blow out. That's all that happens with that stuff. We need to be in it for the long haul. And the older you get, the more pressure you have put on you. And here's Moses, and he's holding up the hands. And you know what? The secret to him holding up his hands has to do with humility. 
And I don't expect a whole lot of amens or heads nodding at this point, but you have to swallow your pride and accept some support. Aaron and her get on either side of him. I don't need your help. I can walk perfectly fine. You need some support. Imagine you have your car and you run out of gas. So you get out and put the car in neutral and push the car everywhere you want to go. Years ago, we had a Volkswagen. Y'all have Volkswagens around here? Now, they were all the automa- uh, uh, standard stick shift. And a Volkswagen, you could always jump it off. You could put it in neutral if you found a good heel. You could push it, jump in, throw it in gear, and you could jump it off if your battery died. And so you could always jump the car off. Can you imagine having your car and the battery's dead? So you jump it off by pushing it, jumping in the car, put the clutch on, put it in gear, and you jump it off. And your friend comes up and says, let me look at your battery. And he looks up and he takes the wire and it's loose. And all he does is tighten it. And then you crank it up. And for two years, you were pushing the car and jumping it off. (laughs) And all you had to do was just tighten up the battery. A lot of Christians are trying to hold their hands up by themselves without Aaron and her on either side. Look around, there's a church here. God did not mean for you to do this Christian life alone. God gives you brothers and sisters in Christ. Even pastors have pastor friends that pray for them. They have camaraderie. You need your brothers and sisters in Christ. You need Aaron on one side and her on the other side to help hold those hands up. Flip over, if you will, one more place we're going to turn. And that's it. Go to the book of Jude, right before the book of Revelation, the book of Jude. I want you to see this because it's very important. Jude. Jude, verse number 20. Jude, verse number 20. He says, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And if some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Notice in verse number 20, you're going to have to build up your faith. Anybody here exercise? You have to build up. You don't start off and do 200 push-ups. You might start off with 10 push-ups. And then you move on to 15 push-ups. Then you move on to 12. You're going to have to build up yourselves in your most holy faith. The Bible says that David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Notice not only that, the Bible says in verse 21, keep yourselves in the love of God. You're going to have to build up and keep up. Here's my problem. Everything else in life, we apply these principles of building up and of keeping up, except the Christian faith. We think as Christians, we have arrived. That once we know a little bit of Bible, once we've heard a few hundred or two hundred or a thousand sermons, once we've memorized some scriptures, we got it made. We think we come to a place where we plateau. We're on the mountain, we stick our hands up, and we'll stay there forever. You're deceiving yourself. Your hands are dropping. And unless you build up and keep up 
and pray up. It's all in the text. And help others up and look up. Your hands are going to drop. I want to encourage you to keep your hands up. And you cannot do this without Jesus. You cannot do this without His power. And thank God there's two sides of this. There's His side and there's our side. His responsibility and thank God He's always faithful. He says, if you come to me, I'll help you. If, if you come to me and you, and you labor and you're heavy laden, I will give you rest. He says, we'll yoke up together. And so you get in the yoke with him and they'll have two oxen in that yoke and, and Jesus Christ will be beside. And you know what? He carries most of the weight. <laughs> he carries most of the weight. But then you have a responsibility. You've got to pray up. You've got to build up. You've got to keep up. You've got to help others up. You've got to look up to him. Because these other, this younger generation, they are watching you. It is important that you finish right. It meant so much to me for me to watch my father as he died to know that he finished his race right. He loved God. And I saw him all through the years. I never heard my father say a curse word. I watched my father be a good testimony for Jesus Christ all of his life. That did more for me than any sermon I could ever see preached. This younger generation, they're watching you. You have a great responsibility, but you have great resources. You see, they actually, don't tell them that they're helping you, but they're actually helping you. See, you don't let them know the secret, but they really encourage us, right? I told them and I told them last year and the year before, I get more out of coming and preaching and, and watching those kids, I think, than I contribute. It is such a blessing. I feed off of that spiritually. And you can feed off of that too. But they're watching you. Back in 1968, in Mexico City, they had the Olympic Games. And during that Olympic Games, they had the marathon competition. And toward the end of this competition, there was only a few thousand people left in the stadium. About an hour previously, the first place winner had crossed the finish line. So there was not many people left in the stadium, a few thousand people, when a man from Tanzania came. He came hobbling across in that stadium with his leg all bandaged up and bloodied. And he was basically just dragging himself with each and every step to the finish line. And as he came through that stadium, the few thousand people that were there, they all stood to their feet and gave him a standing ovation and applauded him as he drug himself, bruised and battered, across the finish line. He was last place. He was the last runner to finish he had fallen and was injured. After it was all finished and over, a reporter interviewed this man from Tanzania. They asked him, why didn't you just quit? I mean, you, you were wounded. He has a wounded leg. Why didn't you give up? Why didn't you quit? He said, my country didn't send me 7,000 miles to start the race. They sent me 7,000 miles to finish the race. Bible Baptist Church International, God has you here to finish the race. Keep those hands up. Pastor Kim, keep preaching. Keep preaching the truth. Keep exposing false doctrine. Stay the course. Pastor Shribe, stay the course. This younger generation, they're watching, they're learning. Church members, stay faithful. Keep your hands up. Somebody said what parents practice in moderation, children will practice in excess. What parents practice in moderation, children will practice in excess. 
As we move to the invitation time, I want to ask you this, older generation here, parents and church members. Do the younger generation, do they see you pray? Do they see you get right with God? You say, I'm too proud to pray in front of them. No, they need to see that. They need to see that you're submissive to God. You wives are to submit to your husbands, but you husbands are to submit to Jesus Christ. If you want your wife to submit to you, you better be submitted to Him. Older generation, do the younger generation see you love God? Do they see you depend on Aaron and her and love the brethren? You know, Jesus said, by this, all men shall know that you're my disciples, if you have love one to another. You say, I wish they were more loving as young people. Well, you need to be more loving. They are pattering. They are forming a pattern based on what they're seeing from you. In verse 16 of our text, you'll notice Moses says that they will have war with Amalek. Look at this. From generation to generation generation. You know what's going to happen if the Lord tarries? Now I hope, as Pastor Kim said, I hope Jesus comes today. Amen. That would be a blessing. But if He tarries in our sight, if if it goes on another 20 or 30 or 40 years, this younger generation will be in your place now. There's a legacy that you're passing behind. There's a spiritual legacy that you're passing to them. You fought Amalek. Will they fight Amalek? Will they pass on what they've learned to the next generation? It all depends on whether we're going to hold our hands up or not. First and foremost, don't drop your hands because of Jesus. He's the one we serve. That's who we give account to. But secondly, look around and see these these kids. It matters. Keep your hands up for them. I don't want to be a pastor that quits and they say, oh yeah, I remember Pastor Walker, he used to be a good preacher. He used to be a good pastor. I don't know what happened to him. He's not preaching anymore. I don't want that to be me. It could be me. If not but the grace of God, I would quit tomorrow. And if not for the grace of God, you would quit. But I don't want that legacy. I want to have a legacy where younger people look and say, look at that, just like Dr. Ruckman. He's still preaching. He's 60. He's 70. He's 80. He's 90. And he's still preaching. Dr. Ruckman did more for the Lord, it seems like, after he was 70. I mean, he did so much from 70 to in his 90s, it seems like. What a legacy and a testimony For us down in the valley as we look up and see that old man holding up his hands. Keep your hands up. Amen. Amen. Father, I pray for this church. I pray for each and every one of these members. I pray for this pastor. God, that you would just encourage them. Lord, I want to continue to hear good things about this church. That they're still preaching to the lost and still being a testimony in this community. And a testimony for Jesus. Lord, their example already spreads out. God, they already have a great ministry. But God, I know you don't want to see it fall. You don't want to see it fail. I pray this older generation would keep their hands up. God, it does matter. These kids are watching them. They're pattering their life after them. And God, I pray you'd put some courage and some strength. Lord, help us to respond to you and to keep our hands up. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.